I'm really pleased to uh, be here today to uh, present with Paige Fisher, who I know from her work at Vancouver Island University and uh, doing some research with the Ministry of Education, and Laura Tate, who is a principal in the Nanaimo uh, Ladysmith uh, School District, principal of Aboriginal education. So um, there are uh, some things that we have been uh, working on in the Ministry of Education and with you people in the field for some time. And the focus of my work has really been around improving uh, the academic results for Aboriginal students. And for a long time, we've done that by focusing on what we do with and to Aboriginal students in the school system. And we're moving, and I'm really pleased that we're moving, um, that our objectives around that are changing and becoming more solid. And here's the objectives that really guide my team uh, at the ministry, and no longer just the Aboriginal team, but all my colleagues in the ministry. And I'm hoping that you will pick these up in your practice as well. And the first is that we need to include Aboriginal voice in everything that we do within education. And so while we are there supporting kids, we do that best when we hear from community and we're guided by the Aboriginal voice. That means parents, community members, elders, leaders, and students. Uh, so there's a handout in your package today, it's on yellow paper, that speaks about those three objectives and the way we're working. If you flip the paper over, you'll see there are principles of Aboriginal education. And these principles were articulated by a group of Aboriginal scholars and knowledge keepers in the province when we worked with Back the Aboriginal Education Steering Committee a few years ago to develop English First Peoples 10, 11, and 12. And these principles are principles that can be adopted into all the coursework within, uh, within the school system. Good morning. My name is Paige Fisher. I was born in Prince George. And my parents were born in Saskatchewan and Wolota, Saskatchewan, I think, and Kelowna. And their, my heritage before that was British on both sides of the family. I have one side of the family, my mother's side of the family came as part of the United Empire Loyalists uh, in the 1700s, so um, my family has been uh, settling and settled in this land for a very long time. I, uh, in my role right now, I'm a teacher educator at Vancouver Island University, and as Trish said, a researcher as well, and my research work is most intensely around the emotional impacts of our assessment practices. So here are some big ideas and we're going to go through them sort of individually for a few minutes. The first is the moral imperative and I, I don't really think I need to talk about this too much. I think that we can look around our schools, we can look around our communities and we can see the state of our Aboriginal students. Our Aboriginal students are neither participating nor succeeding at the same rate as their non-Aboriginal counterparts. Right? There's at least a 20 to 30 percent gap in graduation rates. Right? We're seeing um, more Aboriginal students in, say, you know, our COM 11-12 than we are in our English 11-12. So we know the state, right? You look around our communities, we look around our reserves, we see it. The moral imperative is there. This is something that I was sort of, you know, working on and thinking about for a few years. Um, and it took me a long time, actually, to, to sort of articulate it. These tiles represent about 50% of the Aboriginal kids in residential school who never made it home. And they communicated in whatever ways they felt, these kids, once they did some learning units around residential schools, and then they gifted these tiles to a residential school survivor, an elder, they smudged these tiles, and eventually these tiles were sent back to Ottawa, and I believe all of the tiles across Canada are going to come together in a bit of a traveling road show, and you'll see, we'll be hopefully be able to see all of these tiles together. Trish introduced this concept of Aboriginal education for everyone. And I think that that green ball in the middle is how I sort of visualize Aborig Aboriginal education over the past, you know, several decades. Where we have given a lot of attention and a lot of focus on our Aboriginal students. How can we help them? How can we fix this problem? The energies had, had sort of looked like that. And out of that, I believe, we've built some amazingly, amazingly strong Aboriginal education departments. Aboriginal leaders, uh, Aboriginal focus at the ministry level, 
all of these pieces. I think they've, they've brought us a good ways along the path. And in my mind and in my processing and in what I'm learning over the past several years in my roles is that one of the pieces I believe strongly is that what's going to push us, I think, that next bit, and we're going to get there, is this idea of collective ownership. That we need to grow that responsibility, that passion, that moral imperative, so that everybody is taking ownership over our Aboriginal students, over Aboriginal education. Our next, my next big idea is this idea that, well, you know what, what I get, often I'll get a question, um, like for example, you know, Laura, I have this Aboriginal student in my class, or I have these Aboriginal students in my class. How do I help them? What can I do? What can I do in my classroom for those particular students? I know, for example, that Aboriginal people have an oral tradition. So should I be teaching them orally? You know, those kinds of things. And I know that me, being First Nations, Simshan, I'm not, an, I'm not an oral learner at all. In fact, I need the visual. I'm totally visual. But I don't feel it makes me any less native, right? So, <laughs> um, and so when folks would come to me with those kinds of questions, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm the Aboriginal resource teacher, I should know the answer to that question. I should know that, and I'm feeling, oh my gosh, I don't feel like I know that, I'm a fraud, right? But as I've grown over the, or, you know, over the years, um, I've now come to the place where, here's my response, that if you as a teacher, as an educator, as an EA, as a principal, whatever your role is, if you reflect on your practice, if you're reflective on who you are as an educator and what you do with students, you'll scoop in about 90% of those Aboriginal kids anyway. That isn't to say, however, that the time hasn't come to start starting to weave in those Indigenous principles of learning. And what we're talking about when we say that is really a different worldview, isn't it? I didn't realize that I'd even had a worldview or a culture until I actually lived in Asia for four years and was able to look back at Canada and compare and think, oh, Oh, that's why we do this. This is how we look at things. It's very different from the Chinese that I'm living with right now. And it wasn't until I did that that I made that realization. So to ask a group of people, educators like yourself, to say, hey, look through this different lens, look through this different worldview, that's a really tall order. It's one I think that we'll get to, bless you. And it's one that I, th and it's one that I think that I hope that's where I, you know, I hold that sort of as my goal, that's where I'm hoping that we'll work toward absolutely to look, th look at the world in a different way. But I want my kids to be immersed in who they are as little Tsimshan and grow up to be big, beautiful, strong Tsimshan and contributors to our community. I want them to, we've, they were given their traditional names, Eli when he was eight months old uh, and, and Madeline when she was about five. They've, so they've participated in holding a feast, they've experienced these protocols. I want them to feel proud of that. I want them to know it. I want them to walk tall. I want them to be proud Simshan people. At the same time, I want them to navigate this world that we live in. Because I could nurture them as much as they're my, my mom, they're, they're Gigi, they're, they could nurture them as you know, strong First Nations people, but we still have to go back out in that world. And sometimes that world's a little scary. If you look at it through an Aboriginal lens, where I spent probably the first 20 years of my life denying who I was as a Tsimshan person, being ashamed of who I was as a Tsimshan person. Am I successful, really? Right? And it wasn't until I was well into my 20s that I began to embrace who I was. Prior to that, I would never tell anybody. You know, like, we're worrying about everyone self-identifying, and there's going to be too many of them, and we're not going to have enough resources and money. It's like, dude, people are not coming out of the woodwork trying to be Aboriginal. It's not necessarily a good thing to be all the time. And that's how it felt. That's how it felt. So I spent a long time denying that part of who I was. And I don't want that for my kids. I want, that. I want them to have that ability to be strong Aboriginal people, but also to navigate this world, the educational world the business world, the, the, the environmental world, but, you know, whatever their choices might be and have those, those, that dignity, purpose, and options, right? That's what I want for those kids. We need kids to be able to uh, write briefs and defend themselves in a court of law and all of those other things that they need that other world experience in as well. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I think on that note, you know, somebody asked me in um, a master's group the other week, what, what was it for you, right? Like, how, how did you, and I, and I had no answer. I wish I, I got to work on that. So if you're thinking of asking me that, I don't have quite an answer ready for it. But I, a large piece of it um, for me, without sounding too corny, was education. 
It really was. I think the further I went and I was successful, the further I got along and I found those adults in my life that were important to me or that believed in me somehow and I keep finding those people. Like when I look around the room, right, I've got Trish, Paige, I've got Linda and Judy, I've got Faye. They believe in who I am and I think they, they are to me now as I'm hoping you will be to your students, right? And it's that relationship piece that's key. And you know that relationship between that classroom teacher and that student is the key, especially your vulnerable students. And likely, many of your vulnerable students are Aboriginal students. They need you, they need that connection to that classroom teacher, to that principal, right? They don't need to be walked down the hall all the time with the Aboriginal EA. That Aboriginal EA can be invited into that classroom. That Aboriginal support teacher can be invited into that classroom. And there we go, building more relationships, right? Utilizing, um, the skills and the wisdom that they have, you're modeling, you're coaching them along and their skill level and vice versa. Key, those relationships are key. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about this. Some of you have likely seen it. It's been around for just a couple of years. Laurie first introduced it at the network seminar two years ago. And this is where my little assessment brain gets to kick in. Um, <laughs> we, I strongly believe, as I said earlier, that I, I'm very interested in the emotional impacts of our assessment practices. And I, I started out my doctoral work thinking, I'm going to you know, do this research and I'm going to figure out exactly which practices do what. Well, it was impossible. But what I did figure out was that it's in the air. <laughs> it's in the room. It's in every single thing we do. And what's really powerful, is, I think, is that the way that we assess and what we assess is a really powerful signal of what we value. So every time we say we're going to assess this, we're signaling that that's something that we value. And really, I would implore you to really, really think about that. And think about that in the context of what Faye will be sharing with you later as well. So this became, then, a signal of the values that Laura has as her hopes for the system, as her hopes for the kids and for the adults living in this society and in this system. And Laura had, because I was the assessment gal, sort of sent me a rubric and said, what do you think about this? I said, let's sit down and talk about it. And we had this amazing afternoon, spent two or three hours, and you know, rubrics are kind of my thing. And so we just, I, just talk to me, talk to me. What are your hopes? What do you hope is going to happen? And we really started with this on a performance standard, you might have called it the fully meeting expectations column. I would never give it a number, by the way. <laughs> but this raising your paddle, acquiring these statements here are what came out of our conversation around what would we hope that all of our adults and all of our kids, and actually by extension all of the citizens of this province, would begin to understand. And so really, it's not an assessment tool to evaluate your kids with, but it may be a place to think or to talk with each other and with your students about where <coughs> you are, where they are, and of course, if it's an effective rubric, it provides some learning progressions. Mm -hmm.